In 2015, I was alone dissecting in the cadaver lab when I first started to think deeply on Sorites paradox or the paradox of the heap. So for those who may be unfamiliar, I want you to imagine that there is a heap of sand in front of you and you remove a single grain. Now, obviously you still have a heap and you could keep on removing grains and you're still going to have a heap. But if we continue along that process, eventually you're gonna have a single grain of sand left. And the question is, when did it cease to be a heap? So for me, while I was dissecting the cadaver lab, my question was really, as I am removing tissues from the body donor, am I removing the humanness of them? At what point does this body donor cease to be a human? Now, you can make the argument that that had already happened upon death. And when I first saw the body, they were already inhuman to an extent. You see this with morticians, first responders, medical examiners, but I think the example most people are going to be familiar with are going to be family members. When they see a deceased loved one, a lot of them will be comforted when they see them, say, in a mortuary because they recognize that whoever that loved one was is gone. And instead, what is left is an empty vessel. But here's the thing that's always been interesting to me about that because we still treat the bodies with respect. And this is cross-culturally true. That would suggest that there is still humanness attached to that body donor or that deceased individual, because they don't even have to be within a body donation ecosystem for us to show respect to them. So there's obviously still some humanness there that we all feel we need to respect. There needs to be some level of dignity given to that deceased individual. In my eyes, what we're really talking about here is the concept of vagueness. That's an actual concept. When something is a borderline case. So if we go back to the example of the heap of sand, we know for a fact what is a heap of sand and we know for a fact what is a grain of sand. The problem is when you start to look in the middle and you start to see there are borderline cases where it could be just a somewhat of a heap or, you know, or even if a couple grains are there, I don't think anyone would really classify that as a heap. There are other examples. A real easy example and common one is baldness. And this is one I'm very familiar with. The question is, at what point does someone become bald? You know, you can be balding, but at what point are you just officially bald? You've lost enough hairs. Was it a single hair that did it? Was it a certain, you know, as the hairline is receding and it gets to a certain point, is that when we can then officially say, ah, that person is bald? It's a very difficult thing to do. And that is because of vagueness. It's really difficult to figure out in the middle where things are on this spectrum. And this is true when it comes to dissecting body donors. When you first get the body, it essentially looks completely normal in the sense that the only incisions that have been made are going to be in the neck for the carotid artery or in the thigh for the femoral artery. This is so the embalmers can insert embalming preservatives to preserve the body donor. They will often come still in their hospital gowns, their hospital socks, or they may just have some kind of muslin cloth on top of them. They are about as human as you can possibly get minus the consciousness aspect. But then what happens through the dissection process, things start to get a little more abstract. But let me put it this way. I've taught probably 10 to 15,000 students in person in the lab over the past decade. And there's this really interesting psychological quirk of humans. Say, if I hand you a brain, I can almost guarantee right now what your response is going to be. And that is one of awe, and amazement and just sheer wonder. You're excited, you're interested, and you want to hold it or at least touch it. If I, instead I gave you an upper limb that still had the hand and the fingernails attached to it, I can also almost guarantee I know what your response is going to be. And at best, it's gonna be a little hesitant. You still may touch and hold the upper limb, but you will at least be somewhat hesitant with it, or it just repulses you, like you are your disgust response is initiated. 
that to me just comes down to a level of abstraction, right? We're getting and diving deeper into the psychology of abstraction. You're not used to seeing a brain. Sure, you know what a brain looks like due to images and art and video and things of that nature, but you shouldn't have seen a human brain unless you found yourself in a horrifying situation for most people across all of time. Whereas you see your hand every day, or even if you don't have a hand, say like if you're disabled, well, guess what? You're gonna see other people's hands. It's, it's not a difficult thing to abstract. We understand it, there's familiarity with it. So what happens as you are dissecting this body donor and you are, it's like you're removing layers of humanness. And eventually you're gonna to get to a point where the vagueness has taken over and you just, you're no longer able to really understand what exactly it is. But at the same time, you know, what are the things that influence that? Because even if you're removing tissues, you're not changing, in many cases, the shape of the body donor. You can remove the skin, you can remove muscle tissue, you can remove so many things, and they still will look shape-wise to be human. So then it get, kind of gets to this point where I'm like, what are we really talking about here? Is, is, is the removal of the skin the essential component? And it's been my experience with thousands of students in the lab that that is not it. That's a huge part of it, but it's not only it. Instead, there's, there, there's something else at play here. So for me, what I've realized over the years is that what we're really getting at here is that we found ourselves inside the uncanny valley. And this is a big valley. So for those who may be unfamiliar, the uncanny valley is a term and a hypothesis that was first brought forth by the robotics professor Mashiro Mori in the 1970s. And the idea was pretty simple. As, again, he was speaking with robotics, but we've act, since expanded this to many different domains. But the idea is, if you're creating something or something appears to be rather human-like, there's this level where we're like, oh, that's cool. That's really interesting and fun. But eventually it gets to a point where all of a sudden our disgust response kicks in. We literally just want to push it away. It creeps us out. This is something being uncanny. Now, uncanniness has been understood since the early 1900s. Psychologists such as Sigmund Freud have talked about uncanniness. The uncanny valley is when you reach that uncanny level, when you reach that and you find yourself in this space where things are just obscenely uncanny. But the thing is, you can get out of the uncanny valley on the other side, where something is just so human-like that we're okay with it. And what I feel as though, is that what we're really, this is what we're doing, where we found ourselves through human dissection in the uncanny valley of sorts. And it's not until you keep on dissecting away and you escape the uncanny valley that things just start to become far more tolerable. Now, people far more qualified than myself have debated the theories and different hypotheses and mechanisms of action behind the uncanny valley hypothesis. Um, and I'm not gonna sit here and pretend as though I've solved something, but for me, what I've realized over the years with working with body donors is that to me, uncanniness seems to be about pattern recognition and violating those patterns. You have to understand that human beings are extraordinarily good at, at recognizing patterns. It's essential to survival. We have to be able to recognize when something is breaking a pattern so that we can make a decision about it, whether that is to avoid it or to tackle it head on. Pattern recognition is essential for survival. When we see humans, we're used to seeing them alive. So if we see them unalive, that is obviously a violation of a pattern. But at the same time, they still fit all these other patterns of recognition that we're used to. They have skin, they have shape, they have form, they have all these other, I guess, anatomical regions and characteristics and structures. So when you remove some of them, we're still able to identify certain patterns and we're gonna still be inside of that uncanny valley. It's not until we can completely break these patterns or at least break enough of them that our mind is able to just separate it out and say, oh, okay, I know this is human, but it's more of an intellectual knowing as opposed to a intuitive knowing. Because there's, I can tell you this from personal experience, it's not as though you treat body donors as though they aren't human. It's just that the more dissection that occurs, you become less consciously aware of it. And it's one of the, instead one of those things that you just have to start telling yourself that over time because things have become too abstract. 
when you have completely de-articulated bodies, things do not look like you're used to seeing. And so you have to remind yourself at times almost, which is why it's like there becomes just this sense of professionalism, this sense of routine. You act this way. You do these things. Like Instead of having to tell yourself to be respectful, you just are respectful due to routine and due to your sense of professionalism because it's not something that you are keenly aware of. But that's not the case, at least for me, when I first see a body donor, one that hasn't had any dissection occur yet. This is one of those things that just like, so for those who may not know, at least with the body donation programs I'm familiar with, the bodies will come wrapped in plastic. And as you unwrap them and you first reveal them, there is a very visceral response. And it's an emotional response. There's this unease that comes with it. And it has to do with just evolutionary pathways. When you see a dead body, what is that? What has that meant for 99.99% of humans throughout all of time? Something bad has happened or something bad could happen due to some kind of pathogen. So we have evolutionary circuits in our brain to say this is not a normal situation. And that is very much engaged when I first see a body donor. But that's all based on pattern recognition as well. So for me, it's about removing that. This is where it gets into that conversation of consciousness. And I kind of briefly touched upon it earlier. And many people will say, what we're, when you really are getting into the vagueness is when you remove consciousness. And the reason why I think this is super important is because, well, first off, by the way, removing consciousness, you are, that's the first step in breaking that pattern violation. But the reason why I'm even talking about this really does come down to consciousness in general, because I firmly believe that while consciousness has been this thing that we've been discussing for thousands of years. Philosophers, physicists, so many experts in so many different domains have questioned and thought about consciousness. But I feel like the, the rubber is meeting the road in consciousness in a way that it never has before. And that is due to the advancements being made in artificial intelligence. One of the reasons why consciousness has been such a hot button topic for a long time, including things say, such as the pro-life versus pro-choice movements, or now again through artificial intelligence, is because what we're really getting at here is how do we say something is conscious when we don't really understand what consciousness is at a very basic level? We talk about things like artificial general intelligence, artificial super intelligence. The hard part is how do we properly define these things when we still cannot say what consciousness is? What is going to have to happen very quickly is we need to figure this out, or at least get better with our classifications and determining these types of things. Because I would not be surprised if we look back at the technology of today, so say like five years from now, we're looking back at 2024 and we're saying, oh, artificial intelligence was conscious. That wouldn't surprise me. If it isn't the case, that also wouldn't be surprising. But what I'm trying to say here is due to the vagueness of it, I would not be surprised. Now, look, I'm not going to pretend like I have the answers. I really don't. My, my real goal with this is to simply have a good conversation and to talk about uncanniness and vagueness and humanness and how these terms are really hard to pin down and how associating it with consciousness, these are all important conversations to have. And my hope is that as we continue to have these important conversations, hopefully we can have more productive results come from the things that are truly, truly important to us.